If you get a chance, Google Ryan. Fascinating. He's not a cricketer, by the way. He doesn't play. You might play cricket. You're not a cricketer, but fascinating background. Kind of, kind of talk to us about your background and how you think your own journey has impacted your thoughts about entrepreneurship, international business. How yeah. how have all those factors collided? Um, I got comfortable talking about myself. Well, uh, because I think hopefully everyone's kind of read my background just a tad. Um, but, you know, I came from working for big, large companies, corporate, publicly traded companies. Um, if you had to put me in a box. Um, but it we won't. But you won't. But other people do. Um, it's scaling and, and, and growing businesses. But I also feel like I can touch a lot of industries. So when I was working for publicly traded companies, you know, hitting numbers, hitting Wall Street, a lot of pressure. But it wasn't where until, you know, there was a... Uh, VC that Howard Schultz founded, bought Pinkberry. Um, they recruited me over, eventually was an officer of the company, took, helped take a startup and took it global into 23 countries. And everybody was like, oh my God, do you know how to do all this? I'm like, I've been doing this for years. But, you know, it was interesting for me because you took someone who's from a big company, put them in a startup, it created a different kind of vibe. And then now, you take someone who is now not in any of those situations, you look at Really for me, my career path has been always, I've always wanted to kind of keep it like a certain place, but then there was somewhere in between there where I felt like I want to be able to do things that I care about and do, and, and, and global was one of the things that I really, really wanted to have an opportunity. I, I feel, almost feel like I'm waiting all my entire life for it. And when I got it, I sure wasn't going to let it go. And, and fortunately for me, it went very successfully. Um, and now I get to be able to talk about and share with people who maybe have gone to other countries to say how, how other cultures, other businesses, the U.S. is not just a trendsetter. You go around the world, Latin America, Middle East, you know, I mean, the Middle East, the MENA region itself, they know our brands better than we do. Um, you know, I, I use it, like, I love talking about Shake Shack, even though we talked about it yesterday on air, but, um, you know, store number three, who knows Shake Shack, actually? Good. So, Five years ago, six years ago, those who are on the West Coast base wouldn't know who they were unless they're really hipsters, which I think many of you are, but um, <laughs> I'm not. I try to, I pretend to be one, but I'm not. Um, and store number three, the third store in this entire chain. So you guys know it's based in New York, right? Where do you think it opened? Where did it open? Tokyo. Who said Dubai? I heard Dubai. It was at the Mall of Emirates. I actually was there at opening day. We shared the same. Oh, were you there? Oh, long story, okay. Um, so we share the same partner uh, for our partners with them. And so I went, they gave me the tour, and I'm like, you run this better than the operations was like, you got a sandwich within five minutes. Like, that's not how those stores are running in New York. And they're like, yeah, no, we, we, we got it down. And, and they're on, the, on day number one, there was a line out the door. No really heavily marketed thing. If you had to open that in LA at that time, I almost assure you there wouldn't have been that kind of line because people didn't know what it was. And so I use that example because, you know, food also creates a lot of connections with people and cultures, but there is a lot of trend setting that's going on. Tokyo was a good, good one too because I think Tokyo, Japan's another one that's underestimated. Um, I think in the U.S. we're still trying to figure out. Educating the U.S. culture about Japanese food isn't just sushi. There's so much more to it, and I think, uh, I think there's a lot there. I, I'm telling you, I'm taking it, transcending, I love it. and I love it. And, and we're going to be interactive. So I love keep it. You guys and I and be thinking of hard questions. We easy questions. Pick at him. No easy questions. questions. Only easy. <laughs> Social responsibility and business. Uh, I'm a big believer of you can make money and give back, right? That's just I think very. It's a simple mindset. I think those who don't believe it, um, I would say, well, if you want to be in business for a long time, that's a long-term strategy that you'll get an ROI back. And so then. Like, okay, Ryan, that makes sense. What does that mean? Not just writing a check and say, hey, here's how much money we give. And can you tell me why you think that's the case? I'll take your silence as I'm scared to answer the question. <laughs> but it is the, generate, the, the students that are in this room, it's because of you all. You didn't know you had that much power. That group holds, and, and, and because of that, we all want to hold companies accountable for being genuine. Think about that for a second. You may be a student now. You still have one of the higher purchasing powers, not just now, but in the future, where your decision to go
go buy something that's 15 cents more expensive or a dollar more expensive because you care about a cause or that brand that they stand for, sends a ripple effect on how other people purchase their patterns. And that's because we live in a digital technical world now. And you're being held accountable. You look at the examples from um, in the news in the last two years. I mean, look at what happened to United Airlines uh, a year ago. Um, it, it's not, it, it, what I mean is consumers are holding companies responsible for what they say, what they do, what the mission has had. You've seen board of directors in recent news, as you probably have heard in fast food in the last few days, if it's something doesn't match to corporate policy, they need to act swiftly to hold not just what the employees believe in the company, but also what the consumer has. So the social good aspect of it, it's great to be, have a, a great buzzword, but really does need to mean something because you, know, you are being held accountable for it. And I think that's what's changed in the last five to six years, which is, which is great to see because now there's so many other different smaller organizations that you can make an impact, right? It doesn't have to be so broad all the time, right? We have the UN SDGs that people kind of try to mimic their businesses, but really, how do you really make an impact is the question. And kind of riffing off of that, I know you really deeply value diverse teams and what that brings. How, how do you, in a practical sense, build that? Like, how, how does that, is it chicken, egg, how do you? Well, it depends. Like, if you come on an existing team, mm. it's a different, it's a different, sure. it's a different, uh, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, and I say we, I say me, you know, don't want to feel token mm -hmm. on a team. Mm -hmm. You want to feel like you have a voice. So how do you really get that? Mm -hmm. So a good example, you know, the board of directors, like the average stat in the S&P 500 is you know, average age is 67, only 10%-ish women and only 10%-ish minorities. And guess what? That number isn't really going to change heavily in the next five years, you know, taking California outside of what's going to happen there. So here is an opportunity to be, not just to say, well, I hired a person of color or I, I have a woman because I needed to. The, the, it's the skill set that is missing, right? If you're trying to take a company and be more innovative and being different perspectives, you're missing something, right? And that's a little harsher category because it's so on that low end, right? And so how do you really change if you had something new? The best way to integrate it is hire the best person. Let's keep it simple for a second. Hire the best person. Make sure that you get everyone from all different kind of perspectives because I think it, there isn't, we get caught up into the box again. Like, it's this box, well, I'm looking for someone who's got 25 years experience, who's done this in the, their entire life. Mm -hmm. Well, if your company has gone change over the last five years, which I'm pretty sure there is many of these companies have ch got seen a lot of disruption, I'm not saying that person's not a great fit. There's probably some other people that maybe has 15 years experience and they spent five years experience in a different box that you may want to be able to talk to and add value to and listen to. Um, I think that's where it pushes the conversation. And I think if you put that onus, that's interesting to me because it does change the tone. Because there's always going to be there's there's going to be biases. Like you get ju people judge people at all at a lot of times sure. um, on who they are, what they think they know, who you are, and I think your job is to to make sure that they get who you are. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping in uh, in my lifetime that we will get to equality and you know to have neutral you know just equal pay, gender equality. People feel that they, there isn't that perspective. I think it's good. I remember saying this at a conference that was a, a male dominated conference. And I said something like that. And um, let's just say it didn't go really well. Um, and I wrote a piece uh, on, um, on that, how businesses and governments and citizens need to all come together to achieve it. And it got posted and then it got posted on LinkedIn, like 4,000 likes and 300 comments later. Uh, I got killed for it. A lot of great comments. Like I had a few comments at 50 likes on it, which is great, right? That means people are interacting. But then there's this piece that people didn't understand. Like there's the extremes, and then there's the people just understand what equality meant, right? And I think that's where we are in society today, is really explaining what that means, um, that it isn't the same, right? And I think if we were a little bit more aware of that, I think we put ourselves in a better spot. Um, and, and again, it starts with us, right? This international interactions is not in the business realm, in any kind of realm. Um, so yeah, getting trolled is always fun. <laughs> and I think back to your comment, I think this generation is interesting. I think they will hold us accountable and hold us to change in a very different way than perhaps. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm excited. I, I think it, 
um, there is this pattern of, and, and, and it's funny, because I th I, I, I'll use the baby boomers as an example, is that, you know, there is a learning curve. Like, people are open to it. It's, right? People do see how other people do things and do change. There is some patterns sometimes that are being changed. So it gets people to think about those issues. So back to entrepreneurship. I'm assuming those of you sitting here are either hoping to be an entrepreneur, you are an entrepreneur. Hold on, hold on. Who, who, oh, who wants to be question. an entrepreneur? Raise your hand. Good question. Yeah, no assumptions. Uh, and then who has entrepreneurial spirit? Raise your hand. You better raise your hand, everybody, because I, I just <laughs> said everybody has it. <laughs> Advice for them. So I, 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 I have to give credit to credits due uh, always. My wife is like truly an entrepreneurial spirit person. Like, I'm not, funny enough. That's not, or at least that's not how I started. Um, now people put me in that category, but I, I always, like, I probably knock down her ideas all the time and she hates it. No, hold on, let me rephrase it. Not probably, let me look at the camera all the time, um, but she continues to pitch these ideas of things that are missing and that are working, and, and there's just different mindsets behind it. And you know, for the, the, the people that raised their hand who said, I want to be an entrepreneur, right? Find something that you're passionate about. Find something, it doesn't have to be like world-breaking something else. Find something that you can make better. Keep it simple in those things, and you can stay on that task and focus on the problem. Sometimes, like people like myself, like, I'm really, I, I know what I'm good at. Like, I know if someone has something, I can take it and, and go. My, my thing is understanding your strengths and weaknesses as well. I kind of sometimes have to have it perfect. <laughs> I kind of have to build something perfect for me to do it. And sometimes it doesn't have to be completely perfect. Sometimes it, you have something there, and then it takes that courage to be able to go, I'm going to do, do that piece. And I think use majority of the trait for entrepreneurs, they have that, and then those who, those that every person raise their hand that says, I have entrepreneurial spirit, look at ways that make your, make your life more efficient. Think about that for a second. That doesn't mean you have to build something or sell something. Find ways that you can make your life more efficient, that you can create more time. And you'll find something in there that um, will drive you to something, some passion, and really cut out the other things that maybe you're wasting times on something else that maybe you should on somewhere else. Again, ask, all advice that I wish somebody would have told me, by the way. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you a question, too, about I love your idea of not being put in a box. I want to go back to that. I keep saying that, but I people keep putting me in a box. We are going to resist it. I like that. <laughs> I'd love for all of you to start to think of questions you'd like to poke at Ryan with. Uh, you have him before CNN tonight. He's on CNN tonight, so you guys have a preview. 4, 4 so you, 15. 4 this afternoon. Yeah. So. One question, how do you resist not being put in a box? And how do you feel comfortable? You know, we talk a lot, I, I work in career services, we talk in, with students about having your pitch. Yeah. But I'm cringing as I yeah, say that I, because I, I think, right oh, yuck. That. Yuck, because I'm almost asking students to put themselves in a box. And I love that you've resisted that. Talk to us about how that feels and how you navigate that. It doesn't that. feel good um, <laughs> because it's hard. Yeah, I think people want, you're not, like, I get it all the time, what's your 90 second pitch? I'm like, I don't have one. Mm -hmm. And if you did, I'd be really hard tasked to one because I feel like I can mm -hmm. touch a lot of things. Mm -hmm. The hard part is, um, I don't have too many gray hairs yet, but you know, I, I am around a lot more in the stuff that I do. There is, I do, people need to have a box. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate because I think I need to understand what their box is. Mm -hmm. So I flip it around the other way. Go, okay, what, is, what are they looking for? Mm -hmm. Not that I'm gonna change myself, for them, but like there is a few two, two, three skill sets that I think that they would attribute to. Because if I went to everyone and said, you know, so, social responsibilities, every, you know, this is what you should care about, you can probably imagine how many people would probably be turned off of that piece. But that's who I am. Like they research me, that's what I care about. Um, and I think when people say pitch yourself, I take it the other way around. I'm all just stay with who your values are, right? Uh, it, it, again, if you're I don't know how many more days if we are in an elevator, like I always have this idea, can you sell me this pen? I'm like, here, take it. <laughs> like I don't, well, I'm not gonna, I can't make that magically make it better, but you know, I know what this pen represents, right? And, I, and, and, and sometimes not all employers get it. I know there's a few employers in here who get it, um, that it's about that, right? And I think when you find the matches of that, you find yourself a lot more comfortable. So I didn't really answer what students should do. 
I think the students that are in here, you know, you continue to reevaluate yourself. Write stuff down on a piece of paper why you think you're good at that specific strength. Mm -hmm. Then go back two months later, do the same thing. See if it's the same, the same reoccurrence or if it's a trend of what stands out. Um, I kind of do that. I still do it at times now. Um, not now, as a cringe, like, what do people see me as and what do I think I'm good at, right? And there is a disconnect at times, um, what it is, unless, unless you have someone like Robin next to me who researched me, <laughs> scared me, <laughs> knows everything about me, um, and I really appreciate that. And I do want to mention one more thing, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. since we're going this route. Sure. Where's Aaron? So why am, I, why am I on campus? I'm not an alum. Aaron, was it four years ago? Three, four years? No one's counting. Um, we got connected, and you know, relationships matter, right? And I've been able to see the things that, that she's been doing, and um, I wasn't cool enough to be asked by then, but I am now. I'm kidding. Um, uh, and she asked, can you come? And I said, yes. It's because these are relationships that matter, right? Not to say that I would say yes or no if she would have randomly called. Um, I would say yes, right? Yeah, okay. Um, but those things matter. The group that you're in in your cohort, I think maybe my, I'm going to answer that question right now. I wish that I would have got to know more students, of my peers at that time, um, because those relationships do matter. Because you trust them, you like them, they, they push you thinking, and this is the time that you'll have actual time to doing it um, than getting in the road. So spend some, spend, spend some time if you can getting to know people's thoughts about not just, you know, even a bit, like I, someone told me this the other day, it kind of made me smile. Um, it was a, a group of students from uh, Drucker, like, yeah, we just go have a, you know, we were at a party and we were talking about like for two hours about some business case. I'm like, oh, for class? They're like, no, we were just talking about it. I'm not saying you should do that, but it, it caught me very interesting because I feel like those kind of conversations like, oh, my certain brand or certain tech company, do you see the new AI? Um, wow, what a conversation to co have to come out that you learn more about from each other. And you get to really know people that way. And the trust piece is so huge, isn't it? Yeah, I think um, it's really hard to find people that are, you know, quality people that you trust and that, you know, vetting is really a, a process of its own. So now your turn. You have this opportunity to pick his brain, and I'm even going to put him on the spot any topic you want. International business, <laughs> politics, entrepreneurship. He's, he's got some really interesting she's perspective. Making, she's hyping me up. This is too bad. No, just... justifiably, justifiably. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions that they would love to shout Just to out? be clear, I'm, there you go. Oh, yeah. Aaron's got, well, Aaron, you can have a question. I have a question. Okay. <laughs> so, why would you say, looking back at your early experience, what knowledge, skills, experiences were critical to bring you to where you are today, so that you are speaking on things from yeah. you know, the trouble with McDonald's to Shake Shack? So two, two, I'm gonna answer that, the second part. The first part, you triggered something. Don't give in. So your first few jobs, or if you're, you, you get your entry, entry jobs, or you're in a job that you can do more, don't give in. And what I mean by that mean, like, you may feel like you're not getting credit for the stuff that you're doing, right? That you could do more in your job. You feel like you should have the extra title. You should be higher up faster than it is. Don't let that situation frustrate your work. Like, at the end of the day, you are the one adding value to yourself. So remember that. So if some boss is not giving you an opportunity to present in front of the board, and they say, here, you know, this is what happened to me. Here, mark this up, Ryan, on a PowerPoint. Obviously, I can mark it up, and I did, give it back. Or I can study the, study the, the bejesus out of it and be able to maybe add a few points to the boss and say, hey, do you know X, Y, and Z? What, do you think, what points do you think he or she used? Mine. And what do you think is going to happen when there's a project nobody else wants to do um, and, and someone has to lead it? Who are they going to give it to? I, got, I actually got an office move uh, out of that. <laughs> Worst ever, but I've been through three office moves and I'm really good at it now. Um, and it's a skill set nobody wants to have, right? And I, I got it. And it was the same way like um, with the malls. Like I know ridiculous amount of information about malls that I shouldn't know. Um, name a city. 
this is gonna be hard. Anywhere from Alice, anyone from not California, raise your hand. What cities? Uh, Phoenix or Kansas City. Okay, Phoenix, Phoenix, you know, you got um, Scottsdale Quarter, which is new. You've got um, Mace Rich Mall that was owned. Um, well, Phoenix has got a whole bunch. Um, Goodyear, Arizona, Glendale was there before. Like they have a huge lifestyle center now. He's shaking his head because, and I don't, I didn't, and he's smiling just to be record. <laughs> Why, why, why do I need to know all that information, right? And that was part of the things that I wanted to be able to learn the U.S. and maybe I didn't get the opportunity. When I did, I was prepared for it. And so um, I think if I had someone just tell me that in my ear, it opened up my idea. Like, add value, make yourself better. When that opportunity comes, you're flourished. But if you focus on the negativity of why you're not moving fast enough, um, it does hurt your pro. pro Productivity, and then the second piece you had said, what was? Um, so yeah, looking back at your background, yeah. and how has it led you to where you are? So I, I always felt like the advice, and I'm not saying it's wrong. If people say do one thing, do really good at it. Well, for whatever reason in my career, people always use me for multiple things outside my job description, and so once they know you're capable of it and they can pay you less, they're going to keep giving it to you, right? Especially when you're younger. Um, and I kept following myself in that situation where I was like marketing new logos, even though I wasn't in there, performas, uh, making brand new ones with the CFO. Really early, early in my career, I was doing a lot of different things, although it was skill sets that it kept following me. And then I, I finally go, I just want a simple job with a simple job description. And then as Robin pointed out when I said that, she's like, well, you didn't really want that. <laughs> um, and then it kind of helped me understand what was the importance about the top line of a business, right? And I think a skill set for those in this room, if you're in marketing or if you're in supply chain or operations, it is vital for you to know what other departments do. Educate yourself on why a certain, if your arm of a company does it. Even if you're interviewing for your first job or to that degree, it's really smart to understand how the department fits in the overall goal scheme of things because you'll learn along the way, and then when you do go to maybe other companies, there's an easier transition of understanding it. Now, that's what I've learned from looking at past. It was really hard to do that when you're in the, in the piece, but I think it was a skill set that I feel like adaptability uh, of me taking, everybody goes, oh, that's so great that you've been taking brands and you've been scaling them, but they've been all in different industries. Like, not technically, it might have been food or retail, but they're all different spots, and it's not a cookie cutter. What's this thing as a cookie cutter? Like you've got to take things that work and that they don't, and then be able to work with it. All right. A question. Uh, often, success is in execution. And so the companies that you've seen and the entrepreneurs that have launched businesses, what do you think is the difference between those that take off and then those that stumble yeah. and stop or the owner you know, gives up and quits? The, 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 and it, it's pretty clear. The first part is that those entrepreneurs and those co companies are always asking questions about from other folks. Like, what else do I need? I, I, get, I see it all the time when, I, when people approach me. Like, why are you approaching me? They're like, well, I want to know what I'm missing. Like, I want to know from a different perspective. I mean, this person is successful, growing businesses, already has the capital. They don't need, they're, they're being hungry. They're surrounding themselves with people that will push them. They're not looking for you know, yes people. They're looking for what, what else is out there that I'm not seeing, right? It's kind of driven that, driven, but also, I guess everyone has an ego, but that ego comes away a little bit, right? And it goes, I need to learn. Always learning, and then how do you add that when you learn something to execute on, right? That's the key, that's the difference between the two. It's one thing to say, hey, this is a great idea. It's another thing to be able to say, how do I execute it in a fast way? And those founders and entrepreneurs you really get the bigger picture. It's like quality over quantity. That's what it means. Like, I mean, uh, people use me as, they, they say, I'm a, what do they say, cautiously aggressive? Oh, I don't even know what that means. Um, <laughs> because it's like, I'm driven about top line revenue on, on growth, but then you can't do every deal. Right? You go and do the right deals. Even if your competitors outpace you, over time you'll catch up because you're doing the right ones, not closing stores or something like that. And I think that mindset is important. Um, especially when they're getting off the ground, to stay true to their kind of principles before they kind of uncompromise the values. Great question, because that one, that one's actually kind of clear when you come across founders. They either, you know, they get it, or they're still in the process, and then those who go, well, this is our thing, I just need to go get funding, that's all that matters right now, 
Um, I get it, but there's more that matters to that. Can you talk a little bit about how the, the spirit changes over the course of your uh, career? Um, everyone here is a lot younger than I. <laughs> when I was their age, I had my goals. Yeah. And, and I went for them. Uh, 40 years later, I still have goals, but they're very different. So how do you keep that passion for that spirit going? Yeah, that's a good question, because I think for me, too, it's changed. Like, you know, what organizations I want to be a part of, what causes that part of it. I think um, it's interesting. If you look at for for the things that you care about might have, may not have changed, but your goals of what you want to make an impact, right? I look at this question of, I always try to keep it simple. Like, what do you want to make an impact right now, right? That would be the first thing I would ask. And um, let's say it was, I want, I want that uh, um, in STEM, I want everyone to have an equal opportunity in STEM with their kids. So, okay, that's what I want to do. So how am I accomplishing that? Because that's changed, right? That you don't do the same thing. That's a whole different field. And, and, and to your point, it's like you're changing a career, right? Your, your, your spirit does change, so that means you have to change with it. That means edu re-educating yourself. It's, a, it's almost like a job change. And I found that out for myself. Um, like, so, you know, I was at Money 2020. It was one of the keynotes, and we were talking about uh, cybersecurity. Me and Master, MasterCard and I were talking about it, and people were like, why are you talking about that? Why are you talking about cybersecurity? And I'm all from a small business owner and individual they're the ones who are going to get hacked and hurt the economy, right? And MasterCard got that. They understood that we need to help educate. Like, if you're passionate about that. So I, under, I mean, I have enough learning of it, but I dedicate, like, tech is great, but we also need to be inclusive of everybody, right? And it's just not for big companies. Um, and so hopefully I answer that a little bit. Because it, it feels like it's a relearning process, right, to keep that spirit going. Because... You can't, you, you know, I always feel like we're always learning, but it, it's also there's so many new things that are out there that get you to push to, to new things that I feel like that's the, mm -hmm. that's the place. Hopefully I got it. Yeah, <laughs> Good question, though. Um, a few minutes ago you said how you feel like you don't really have the entrepreneurship spirit, and it seems that a lot of people are born with it and they're visionary. So my question to you is if you agree with that or how do you think along the course of someone's life how they could change their personality. So do you believe in that? I, I kind of do. So you believe that they're born with it? Born with what? Like specifically? But I feel hmm. that people are born with more visions for the world compared to others. Mm -hmm. But I do think that over the course of someone's life they can change that mm -hmm. and have more of a visionary mm -hmm. outlook on society. I, you know, I think, you know, like we, we put everyone in who's an extrovert, who's an introvert, right? Exactly. And then everyone goes, well, I'm an introvert, I'm an extrovert. But there's a way that you can impact both, right? Mm -hmm. um, you guys may or may not believe this, but, you know, if this was a party right now, where would I be standing? In the corner. This is naturally, that's what I do. Um, it's, it's just hard. I don't know. This is recorded. I shouldn't say this stuff like this. Um, but... I think everyone has an opportunity to be a visionary. Um, I think, does it become easier for some? Sure. I think some people are just, they see the bigger picture and they can run with it. But I also think we live in a world that it's really more complicated now. Like, it's not as simple. Like, you really do, like, people ask me all the time for, so I, I am kind of an introvert and an extrovert, but um, people go, well, can introverts become CEOs? What? Of course they can, right? And I think those learn the process of where they can make a stamp with their visionary piece to it, right? They've learned how to craft their own message. There isn't a one, because it used to be just, well, if you want to be, well, a long time ago, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you got to be loud, you got to be uh, a personality. You don't have to be, right? But you do have to have a skill set to be able to learn through that vision. You do have to think broadly around it. I think, and, the, and many of that is a learning perspective. I was taking the example of those founders who are always learning, I think that, because they're learning to try to create a bigger vision, right? Because it is limited of what you just know. Even for myself, like I may know a lot of things about different cultures. It's really an understatement if I walk into a new country and thinking that I know their vision, right? Or know that this is how the way they should do it. And I think that's a good way for all of us to learn. I mean, yeah, it is easier for the sum, but I really do believe that people can learn it as long as they're willing to.
right? They got to be open to it at the end of the day. But yeah, great question. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, thank you. You spoke earlier about the global picture. Um, could you elaborate a little more about the differences between developing uh, locally within a single country versus the scaling yeah. globally? And yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's it's funny because um, it's tied in Pinkberry. You know, we had 70 plus stores in the Middle East region, and then we had Latin America and Peru. We had like 20 plus stores, and I, I you talk about how they were different and the same at the same time. Like the, the the word of you know, think global, act locally, right, is something that is a phrase that people say, but it's really hard to execute. And I think when you like. Even with flavors, like, you know, we there was a lucuma flavor in Peru. That's another natural fruit that we that we op chose to open with, that you had to open with, right? There's a difference. A like, we should open it, or it's a must to open, right? And I think when you create the must and those non-compromising things that, well, if we're going to open this, we want to be our local story. We want them to really believe and in, embed in, in, in their culture. They can see it real quickly, right? And I think that's key when you're trying to build not just in one country, but scale, because then it kind of has a ripple effect to how see the, the bigger picture. Uh, again, it, for international companies coming into, for US company going international markets, there's this balance of sometimes it's cool to be a US company, and sometimes it's not. And I think part of that is, you know, I, 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 I give credit to Starbucks effect. People usually say, oh, I'm, people don't go say, I'm gonna go get coffee. People say, oh, I'm gonna go get Starbucks, or hey, Give me the, uh, put your Nikes on. They don't go put the shoes on, right? And, and I think that's what, in each country, each local, local understanding, you want to build something like that. And then how do you scale it globally? Each country is its own different. It doesn't matter if they're neighboring countries. So really kind of understanding. We, I, w I did a lot of, like even for China, for example, like I did so much research on Beijing, Shanghai, the failures, some successes, why they fail across all kinds of industries. And they were all different. I mean, there. I mean, you couldn't really pinpoint. I mean, you could pinpoint a few things, but like, how would you know for sure that you were going to be successful, right? And so you really had to kind of, you know, was it partners? Was it food? Was it supply chain? Pick the things that you were trying to focus on to make it work. That you know that maybe a certain it's a challenging place if it's capital or infrastructure, um, and and try to address that going into it, versus where many brands, what they do. They go into a country, you're open, haha, we're here. Let's, why is this not working? Like, you know, McDonald's went into India. It's a great case study. You know, they went to India, didn't have the right menu. And, you know, they were shut out for many decades. And now they're back and they're doing great. I wonder what changed. And again, the biggest brands have made mistakes and they've been able to come back. But you would say, would they not know that? You never assume. <laughs> you never assume. And I think that, that's, that's what's been fun about I just remember almost a decade and a half ago how people were fighting about should it be English or should it be in the local language? Mm. And I'm like, why is there a fight there? Why can't it be, if you want to do both, keep it both. Like, you need people to understand. I, keep, I say it that simply, but that was what the pushback was. Like, it has to look like and feel like every single place versus it being their own. And now it's a flip. If you see, everybody's really ingrained in the community, even for tech companies. They have headquarters in other places. They want to be embedded with the employees in the, in the country. Other questions? Oh, this is yes. One for you. <clears throat> so talking about gig economy, a lot of people have a side hustle. Mm -hmm. uh, just thinking about entrepreneurs. Like in order to make a real impact as an entrepreneur, um, do you think you're able to do that as a side gig? Or is it one of those things that you think as an entrepreneur you really need to you know, do that one thing and be really good at it, and then kind of piggybacking on that, uh, like an advice piece of, you know, someone's doing that, when do you think the right time to jump into it fully would be and kind of leave the comforts of a nine to five? So yeah, that's a, Jason, that's a very specific question. That's uh, almost like you're going through this a little bit, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it, it's funny because so one, the, I'll answer the first part. The first part is when do you know? Like to kind of push, like everybody wants to stage, even including myself, someone to tell you. To say, okay, it's time to go do this now. 
doesn't always happen, right? That which one's bigger, which one's not. I think you understand that I've seen like, if the side gig's taking less revenues, but you know that you're not creating enough time to create it, you do also have to make test it, right? So you'll have to create, you know, what's your risk, right? And I think that's the question that you're really asking me. It's like, what, is, what should my risk be to do this, to do that? And that part I can't answer you directly, but I can answer you things that you should look at, right? And everyone's at different parts of their lives. So for the younger generation, it's like, well, this is gonna take another loan. You know, how much money am I, am I if I take this away, how much money am I gonna lose for my day job? You know, where do I get the capital behind it? And then there's those that are in the mid-careers, like, this is a lateral move. Like, let me run with it. I've got enough experience, like, should I come back? And is, are you acceptable with those losses, right? I think the key, my advice to anyone that is doing something like that, just understand the risks. It doesn't mean you need to be scared of them. Let me, let me repeat that. You don't need to be scared of risk. It's good to identify them. So don't like close your eyes and say, I don't want to know what would happen if I failed. It's, it's okay to know. That doesn't mean you have, don't have to do it, but if you do understand it, you can really, really decide, do I want to move that forward? And you know, usually I always hear it's always time, right? Time is always the one that goes, oh, I, I, need, I don't have enough time to do this side piece too. And I think when you start getting yourself in that kind of conversation over and over again, and it keeps growing and growing, and you need more time, you know, something's going to pull. Someone's going to pull you. Um, and I think you've got to listen to who, you know, what that situation is. Create, um, I think it's good to have your own kind of board of advisors for your personal pieces to ask people who are unbiased around kind of those kind of situations, not just, not just family members, um, friends, or maybe even um, people from different fields that you met, that you've networked at, and not meet the person in the corner. Um, but that's important because you get a lot of advice from important people that kind of going, well, this person from this place saw this at a different perspective. Does that make me want to go forward? Because you do get influence from people around you as well when you ask. Good question. <laughs> yes. You mentioned the importance of relationships. So one of the questions we have is, you know, we have so many events on campus and students have an actual choice. They can study for a test or they can go for networking. What do you want them to do? <laughs> That's a question for me. I'm going to say them, them not go to your class. Is that what you want me to say? <laughs> no, I'm not supposed to say. I can't say that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what are the three or four things that students can do during their time here, whether it's undergrad or undergrad, that's going to help them be successful as they go on the entrepreneurial path? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm going to say... It's funny. I'm going to say this one thing, and he's in the room. Um, so one of my EMBA or executive uh, MBA classmates is in this room. And I don't think I've ever said this, but my, my class was more engineering, like more Boeing. All those big companies were there. I'm obviously not an engineer by trade. Um, I pretend to play one on TV. Um, I don't. I'm just kidding. Um, I learned so much from them, actually, because they looked at thinking of solving a problem differently than I did. So it could have been a... It could, I, I still remember this case study, it was a telecom thing, and I'm like, yeah, this is easy, this is a straight answer. And they looked at this problem like the complete backwards, backwards in, in the way I looked at it, and I'm like, but they got to the same solution. And I'm like, oh wait, let me, let me see if I can do that in other things that I do to understand that place, and it and made me a better thinker, leader, in general, so one of the advices for students here is that you have a lot of diversity on campus from different people, different skill sets, not just in skin color. People think differently. Learn from that, right? Like, don't, like if so, someone doesn't match your answer and you don't like it, like, it's, o it's okay. But just see, hear a different perspective, because I assure you, you will run into somebody like that down the road again. And I think that's a skill set that is like people pay money to go to MBA schools to understand that, that piece, and you have an opportunity to do that here. Um, you know, I say networking, and again, I, I, I cringe about networking because like, do you really, how do you meet really strong connections? And I think we'll be more pinpointed with your networking, meaning like if you care about social responsibility, you care about um, business or retail, or entrepreneurship, go to those specific things that people are are doing go to like I wish I would have went to like 
venture capitalist private equity stuff when I went to Berkeley. Like at that time when I was there, there was so many of those things there. I didn't take the time to even understand that. Um, who knows? I might have been connected to different people, but that's not why you do it. You would really understand, wow. And more than likely you'll find out, oh yeah, that's the person who's a billion dollar startup founder that was in that club. But I think it's, it's, it's that ability to learn things that you don't know. And I think it has to push you a little bit. It's not easy. So again, those students that are here in this room, I know it's not easy because I didn't do it. Um, but it is a push when you can go in a group of people to connect, especially in, in different places. So I mean, those are the two pieces that I would, I would definitely, and then the third piece, since you got some faculty in, in the room, use them. I don't know if they like, like this answer, but they know a lot of people, pick their brain. Like, don't ask for like handouts. <laughs> like, hey, I saw this, you know, what should I say to this person? Or how do I extract a question that I can get better knowledgeable? Like, you know, you, I mean, the fact that your faculty came in this, in this room to come hear me speak is, should tell you enough about that they're taking the time to do that. And I, I wish I, I would have maybe used more of that. So thank you for those who are in the room. I think you answered my question. Do you have a mentor? I wish I had one. Like I, I didn't really didn't have really a specific one that has I can say started from me and had it. All the bosses love me, but I just didn't have that perspective. Do I have people that are around me that are like a, my own board kind of personal advisors? Absolutely, and they're all from different industries. So I, I confuse them even more because of the stuff that I'm doing, <laughs> and that's a good thing because they also keep me on track going, why are you doing this? Explain to me why are you at Money 2020 at this thing or explain to me why you were in, you know, talking about this specific thing and what's my angle. And if I can't explain it, I shouldn't be doing it, right? And that keeps you in, I think the mentors, if you find a mentor, those who are in the room who has them, keep them. It's so great to have, uh, it's such an impact to have someone like that. Um, I mean, I learned from all the leaders I've worked for for sure, um, but I consider a mentor, when someone says a mentor to me, meaning someone who's there, who's always there, not just making connections, but you know, able to help you move to the next level, right? Really get to, get to the doors that you never really, would never have an opportunity to, to have. Um, that to me um, is someone who really cares, right? And that, that they put their stamp behind you um, and go. So yeah, mentors are, good ones are hard to find. Um, Anyone have mentors here that's students in here? You like them? Okay, good. Are they in the room? No, okay. <laughs> but it's interesting. I think those who just raised their hand, the students who didn't raise their hand, here's a good question for you to ask them. How is it, how is it like working with a mentor? What am I supposed to expect from it? I don't know the answer to that. I, mean, I can't answer that for you, right? You should ask them who just raised their hands to say, hey, what do you take away from it? If you never had one, you wouldn't know. And who are you going to ask? People who have them. That's my per pub public service announcement. I think we have time for one more question. And I'm around after those who want to stay. Uh, I'm here. They can't kick me out yet. They got my lunch. Yes. But if you're not, are you? Yeah, please. That's a great question. What are you reading now? What am I reading now? Everyone asks me that question, and I wish, I, I read a lot of, so I have a lot, I do read books, but I read a lot more articles. Mm -hmm. I, uh, and just because of, I feel like I'm more global, like from BBC, like just new, like news, not so much as much as commentary, but just strategy from uh, different news outlets. Like that's been getting me, because as you can tell, if someone says one subject, there's like 17 million opinions on all the different places. And so, like, I've been reading a lot about, um, you know, a, a lot more about international, like, economies and different ways of doing it. But if you ask me for books, the, the ones that I, I like, I read, there was, you know, Ariana Huffington's book is really good. Um, she, she talks about, if you read her stuff, she talks about um, sleep and, and, and kind of that kind of, how, how do you really, you know, it pushes your mind to think about rest and, Howard Schultz's book on Onward is really good. Those who really care about, um, I've got, to, got a chance to meet him and hear him talk exactly the way he reads the book. So if you read his book, it'll be like you're talking to him. Um, really great the way to see how he turned around that operationally, what 
values meant. Um, I, we got a whole, I got a bunch of them, but like right now, I, I've, these short stories for me have been really, been really interesting because it gets me a lot of different perspectives from different people. Uh, I always love new concepts and new things that are going on, um, so I try to find them from like unbiased sources if I can. Good question, though. I know it's not the typical answer. <laughs> Thank you. We will keep Ryan here. So if you had questions that you weren't able to ask him, I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah, you I, can hang. I, this, I'm, I'm I think here. we should get a picture with him, too. I think it's kind of <laughs> cool that we got him two hours before he's going on CNN. And we can, he said I could tell you to tweet out his picture yeah. <laughs> or put it on LinkedIn, correct? Yeah, I'm not getting yeah, you in you trouble. Yeah, okay. you're fine. But thank you. This has been really thought provoking. I appreciate you coming to University of San Diego. Um, very, very inspiring. Thanks for hosting Thank me. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.